Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker. We are all too familiar with the narratives surrounding wide-scale support for the LGBTQ plus agenda. The normalization of this agenda is now infiltrating our elementary schools and is built on disinformation that boils down to a simple concept that God made a mistake. Gender confusion, same-sex attraction, and the internal battle that rages in the souls of many is a desperate cry for help. But what if there were forces at work to actually criminalize, demonize, and legislate the prohibition of organizations offering help to those struggling with this rapidly growing social and spiritual crisis? Stephen Black has been the executive director of First Stone Ministries since 2000. He's worked in full-time Christian ministry and leadership of First Stone since 1993. He was ordained with International Christian Christian I'm sorry International Ministerial Fellowship in October of 1994. He's an author of many articles and teaching aids, and appears here each month on the third Monday of every month at 11 o'clock Central Time. You can find out more about him at FirstStone.org. Here to co-host this Freedom Realized Hour is the author of Freedom Realized. Finding Freedom from Homosexuality and Living a Life Free from Labels is Executive Director, our good friend, Stephen Black. Stephen, welcome to your edition of Freedom Realized and the Freedom Realized Hour, hosted monthly here on Revealing the Truth. So good to see you, my friend. Thank you. It's good to be here, always. You know, Stephen, um, aside from Dr. Michael Brown, uh, line of fire and his very active voice in this ministry. First Stone has become, in my mind, the preemptive organization for providing the broadest tools, resources, and organization to a national and global issue that addresses freedom from homosexuality. Uh, there's no question that uh, the government is involved in legislating this. The educators are involved in educating this. Uh, it has become a lopsided agenda where 2% are driving the 98%, and the body of Christ is exactly where they were during the Holocaust, and that is the... Nazis were more committed to their sin than the body of Christ was committed to the Lord. Now that's a pretty harsh statement, but it's one I stand behind because I've preached at Dachau, I've preached at uh, um, uh, Birkenau, I've, I've preached at Auschwitz, I've preached at Babi Yar, I've preached in Budapest, i preached in Odessa to the Holocaust survivors. And I've talked with the people who lived in Krakow and said, how could this be going on hundreds of feet from your home and you not know about it? And I remember the words of Pastor Niemöller who said uh, that when they came for the communists, well, I wasn't a communist, so I didn't say anything. And when they came for the trade unionists, I wasn't a trade unionist, so I didn't say anything. And when they um, came for the Jews, uh, I wasn't a Jew, so I didn't say anything. And when they came for me, there was no one left to speak. And those words of a pastor who was silent during this Holocaust is tantamount to the pulpits of American churches, the Western church and the church at large into taking this huge issue and sweeping it under the rug because they don't want to be called bigots, they don't want to be called homophobes, they don't want to alienate, they want to be inclusive and they find that any reference to LGBTQ plus is condemnation and you and I are not in the business nor was Jesus in the business of condemning anybody. We That's are right. not condemning anybody. We are offering a set of tools for those. It's like saying that the suicide hotline should be 
dismantled because it's a personal choice as to whether or not one takes their own life. But what about those who are crying for help? You're not out there trying to convert or to tell somebody or get in their face that your lifestyle is not biblical. You're saying we want to be a resource, a respite, a sanctuary, a place of sources that if you have questions, if you're struggling, if you need to reach out a helping hand, we want to let you know we will take hold of that hand. We're not going to kick, drag you kicking and screaming out of the lifestyle that you're in. We're going to minister to you in love. And you can do that because 28 years ago, you got ministered in love and you came out of that lifestyle. We're not talking to about somebody that's a figurehead or somebody who is, is um, taking an academic view. We're talking about somebody who comes from that world and that experience and knows that when you need help, help is there for you to grab a hold of. So now that I've done my, my preachy, uh, in-your-face kind of setup and uh, smacked every pastor, slapped him right across the face for being tolerant, uh, and being inclusive, and I certainly, we're not exclusive, and we're not excluders, we're includers, uh, but we are not supportive of bringing that lifestyle into our churches and continuing in the practice of it in an overt way. So That's right. You, well, sir, it's, it's, good, it's good to be on with you again. And uh, you have brought up something, of course, it's been quoted many times uh, by the uh, late uh, Edmund Burke, who has told us um, and has been quoted by many other leaders, is that the only thing necessary for evil to triumph or triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. And, uh, you know, you succinctly reminded us of what took place during World War II. And people may think that that is a really, um, maybe a, a, an inflated parallel, but they're not paying attention because you've got these two fists that are going up in our culture right now. One is a black fist and one is a pride banner fist. And people need to be paying attention to that and the, pay attention to the people behind uh, bringing a, a very oppressive and even Marxist type mentality, uh, not only in the culture, but also into the church with social justice movements and this idea that we need to be, you know, compassionate and yet they're not being really compassionate, even at the highest levels of the Southern Baptist Church, the uh, Presbyterian Church of America, your supposedly most ardent Bible-believing churches have bought into the APA Mark Yarhouse paper, which says, you know, we need to be uh, embracing LGBTQ orientation as a sexual minority. And this is in writing. It's not anything I've made up. It's not, I'm not being convoluted or divisive. This is what is being taught now and communicated even within the, you know, upper echelon of a group of people called the Gospel Coalition. So you have these people that are now starting to embrace the idea that orientation is legitimate or because it rarely changes. And I would be the first one to say that coming out of any form of addictive behavior, homosexuality or otherwise a sexual perversity, is a difficult thing to overcome. It's not that we're uncompassionate or unkind about that. We, we definitely need to come beside people and understand their, the difficulty, most of these people with great trauma, childhood sexual abuse, uh, childhood sexual distortions, high 90% of them were exposed to 
graphic pornography, prepubescent. Um, when you start looking at these numbers and understand what has taken place in our culture and why these people go into homosexuality with broken families, uh, not being able to relate well in same-sex uh, parent issues, the defense of detachment, all of these root issues that I talk about in my book, Freedom Realized, are they're there, and it just makes sense. And good psychologists and good therapists actually do know these things. And there are people that are even connected with the APA that are not happy with this new narrative, this this normalization, because what it does is it takes LGBTQ and that plus sign, and people really do need to pay attention to that plus sign because it makes normative other orientations such as MAPS and YAPS. And MAP is the acronym Minor Attracted Person. So it's legitimizing somebody who is a prepubescent attracted person and the APA, the American Psychological Association, the, this this mantra God thing that is in higher learning, is communicating that th this is a legitimate orientation, and this this should cause people real alarm. And then yaps being youth attracted person, so that person that would you know be attracted to someone who's 12, 13, 14, 15 years of age, and legitimizing a post-pubescent person with an adult. So you can't make this stuff up. And what has happened in our culture that even brings a further normalization of this is we have the highest court in the land on June 15th, which uh, was a landmark case called Bostick versus Clayton County. And in this ruling, basically, uh, bottom line, is Neil Gorsuch and, and Justice Roberts capitulated and uh, made an amendment along with the very liberal Supremes that the 1964 civil rights uh, law was to be amended to include LGBTQ plus sign behavior equal to sex or what we used to call gender, sex and gender, and race. Well, this is the most egregious assault, not only now from the Supreme Court, but you've got people in high places in the church that are starting to erode away. And, you know, like our Bibles tell us, right? How much does it take? How much leaven does it take? A little leaven. It's kind of like, you know, we can have lots of great Bible teaching and understanding about sexuality, but we're going to put a, a few drops of sexual perversion in there, and it muddies the whole water. And this is what people need to understand. This isn't compassionate at all. This isn't kind. This is very unloving, because what this does is this hands off to the next generation a cruel bondage, which is that nobody can really change. And that's what the erosion has been taking place, like we saw with Exodus International. I was the chairman of the ministry council confronting all that heresy of antinomianism and hypergrace connecting with this whole Mark Yarhouse paper. Uh, I confronted that, you know, back in 2008. Uh, and so this has been going on for a while. Now it's becoming mainstream in Christianity. So this, what your, you know, your your monologue in the beginning was not out of the, um, you know, this uh, a place of distortion. It actually is what is going on. And then we have documentaries. Uh, there is so much going on against anyone that is going to promote a true gospel-centered, uh, redemptive message of, of sexual healing and deliverance, anyone that is proclaiming that is now suspect to being uh, cruel or offering what they're calling conversion, which is a, a ridiculous term made up by the Southern Poverty Law Center and the Human Rights Campaign. They've, they've got these narratives now, and this is also 
in some of the highest places in the church. You've got the, you know, the 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 big guy, kind of what I call him, you know, not to be uh, uh, disparaging, but he's kind of like the Pope of the Southern Baptist, Albert Moeller, saying that he repents of not believing in orientation now that and making it legitimate. And so you've got this erosion taking place in the church. So at the highest levels, there is an eroding taking place, making it that LGBTQ needs to be normative. And if you talk to anyone, you know, under uh, 25 years of age, they, they continue with the unscientific narrative that people are born that way. It's crazy what's going on in our culture. And we like to give answers of hope. Our, our heart is to give hope. That's what First Stone Ministries does, to give hope. There's an article on our website called Why People Go Back to Give Answers to Why. And we need to give biblical answers to the reasons why people actually do fall back and apostate when you've got leaders that are in these documentaries that are coming out that are actually attacking our ministry and attacking me personally that they're saying that what we are offering and people like myself and uh, there are you know dozens of other ministers that i know that have ministries and churches that offer the same kind of hope and healing and they're saying we are the ones that are cruel. So now evil is good and good is evil in these last days. And we need to give biblical, solid, scriptural answers uh, to the reasons why this is taking place. Stephen, <clears throat> um, you and I happen to know a young man named George. Uh, George, yes. George uh, lived a very active gay lifestyle. He accepted the Lord, and he self-admittedly still struggles with same-sex attraction, but he has committed a life of celibacy while he tries to navigate through these very, very trying emotional times for him. And uh, he was a guest on our program. Uh, mm -hmm. You know him well. I know I him well. And um, he... Uh, uh, there, were, there were comments made blasting him, uh, just, just maligning him for having come out, identified with uh, a fully robust uh, gay lifestyle and saying that I've accepted Jesus as my Messiah, but yet like Paul, I still struggle with things of the world. And I've made the decision that in this time of struggle, until I can be healed, delivered, released from this attraction, I am going to live a celibate life so that I'm going to remove the thing that I know tempts me from my life. Now, I would applaud that for anyone who would come out and tell their story and say, I'm still struggling, but I am not actively living in that lifestyle, and I'm caught in this place in between where I do have a support system of people counseling me, I do have a support system of people supporting me, and people who understand that I'm still struggling. Now, uh, Dr. Mark Baker, who is a, uh, the head of the Levy Counseling Centers in uh, Santa Monica, California, and I've had this conversation before, and we have uh, investigated his best-selling book, Overcoming Shame. Um, mm -hmm. Shame is at the core of these sin responses. Uh, the shame of early exposure to pornography, the shame of one of every three women under the age uh, of 18 have been sexually molested. One out of every seven men under the age of 18 have been sexually molested. This is a problem. The Epstein case and his madam, his mistress, his his uh, paramour, whatever you want to call her, that facilitated all these things, there should be such an outrage 
there should be so much of a 2020 lens on this and looking at, at saying we want to know if this is permeating our government, if these are high-level government officials who have been practicing uh, um, uh, sex with underage, this is rape, uh, this is human trafficking, these are abominations to even the non-biblically based person. Before I came to faith in Jesus, I would have been just as offended as a Jew practicing Jew as I was as I am a practicing believer uh, at the atrocity of bringing any kind of physical sexual harm to a child I think it's an abomination I think it is uh, a reprobate uh, uh, it is a reprehensible um, act uh, perpetrated on someone uh, who, who has no defenses, who has been told by mom or dad or by aunt or uncle or familiar teacher or scout leader or pastor that this is okay behavior and it traumatizes them, it wounds their soul and this is a soul wound that cannot be healed unless there's a great deal of work which is being done to come to a level of reconciliation that one, you as the child were not responsible and we have tens of millions of adults walking around believing they were responsible for this grievous act perpetrated upon them and when they hear the words you didn't do this okay well but i didn't say no and and i and and i i let them do it and no you were a victim you were you were uh traumatized by this this has become so normal that even the atrocity of the Boy Scouts of America, the atrocity yeah. of the Catholic Church, it's not so atrocious. People yeah. are not so up in arms. How is it that the Boy Scouts of America still exist today as an entity in a culture that promoted this? How is it that the Catholic Church had a practice of saying, if we, came, if we became aware of a sexual predator, we just moved him to a parish with other sexual predators. Uh, back in the 70s, I had a friend who was a Catholic priest. He was an alcoholic. When it became known he was an alcoholic, he was transferred to a parish where all the priests were alcoholics. This was their answer to the problem. Don't get to the root of the problem. Don't provide counseling. Put them in an environment where that is, you're surrounded by people who exhibit the same behavior. This has all been exposed, but there is no outcry. There is, no, how is it that a mother and a father, and listen, Jews are guilty of taking a democratic position of liberal life because of family. I will not reject my son because he's a homosexual. He's my son. He's a member of my family. And my commitment to family is greater than the commitment to his sexual behavior. That's why they vote the way they do. My daughter or son got a girl pregnant and we don't want that Gentile child being born out of wedlock. We're going to support abortion. It is a cultural, familiar kind of consideration. It's not based in politics. It's not based in, in uh, 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 anything other than those two principles, family first. I'm not going to reject my child if that's a choice they make. But in our marketing in our bringing it into the schools, into having the transvestite reading hour, we have taken, and this is now the federal government who is by decree, there shall no, be no state religion. By allowing this to come into our schools, it is advancing a state religion and That's that state right. religion is 
homosexuality. That state religion is liberalism. That state religion is the declassifying of sin and normalizing aberrant behavior, which is clearly, which is clearly a religion. Yes, it is. Humanism. It's humanism. And that's, that is what's taking place. And, you know, to answer your question about George and others, um, I did this amplification of John's gospel, verse 12, uh, uh, excuse me, chapter 12, verse 25, and I just want to read it. It says, the one who loves his life, and then this is my parenthetical, loves and promotes promotes unnatural lusts, perverse desires, and appetites in this world. The one who loves his life in this world, these all these unnatural lusts, eventually, Amplified Bible says, loses, it, loses his soul, will have eternal death. But the one who hates his life in this world, that is, the one who kills, puts to death unnatural affections, same-sex attractions and sexual lusts, and then this is the same one who puts energy into pleasing God, a real faith in God, and will keep it, Jesus says, will keep it unto eternal life. Whoever has no love to preserve his fleshly life, sensualities, seductions, and unnatural affection, but puts to death because of his great love for Jesus Christ to follow him fully, this is the one who will have eternal life. And then verse 26, Jesus says, If anyone serves me, he must continue to be faithfully surrendered, following me without hesitation, to hold steadfastly to me, conforming to my example in living, and if need be, suffering, or even perhaps dying because of faith in me. And wherever I am in heaven's glory, there will be my servant also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. And, you know, George and people like him who, you know, wrestle with this with this pain of same-sex attraction and or for some people, many people I've ministered to, you know, I've been doing this for over 30 years now and, you know, walking my freedom out for 38 years. And all of the people that I have ministered to over the years, especially, you know, people now that are getting older, they realized there were there were times when the Holy Spirit would come back, you know, 5, 10, even 15, 20 years later and deal with deep places of woundedness and and places of trauma, places that are a a pain in the soul and bring further healing. And the problem with the people like Exodus and some of these people that are attacking the the gospel and attacking the ministries uh, and making this 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 craziness, this human, uh, this religion of humanism and promoting LGBTQ is they've normalized something that they never really gave the hard work to find freedom in. And the promise isn't that you will be delivered from temptation. The promise is not that you will be uh, delivered from the pain of this life. The promise is that if you will continue to draw near to God, God will draw near to you. If you will submit yourself to him and resist the devil, the devil will flee and you will be able to find relief and peace for your soul. And Jesus says, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your soul. But these people, uh, by their own confession, when you find out the reason why they have apostate, and the reason why they have gone back, and the reason why they're trying so hard to normalize this in our public schools, in higher learning, in, in college, university level, is because they never really gave up their idols of bowing down to Baal and Ashtoreth, their sex gods behind the scenes in the internal world. I have a little phrase that I, I like to, to um, communicate and teach on about the Latin phrase, Coram Deo. 
Coram Deo, meaning being in the presence of Deo God. But my little phrase is, is you have to have an eternal internal. If you don't have a lifestyle with eternity marked inside of your soul, in the fear of God, in Coram Deo, then your internal, if it doesn't change, your external certainly isn't going to change. And it is so it is so much a need for the working on and allowing the seed of God, the DNA of Jesus, the Word of God, to be implanted into the soul, into the mind, the will, and emotions, so that there can be a new trajectory of life. This is the gospel. And the, the ones that believe this gospel, the words of Jesus, that pick up their cross and follow him fully, these are the ones, Jesus says, will be overcomers and the ones who will receive eternal life. These people out here that are promoting these fleshly gospels, this antinomianism, this hyper-grace stuff, this, this, you know, you can be a practicing sexual sinner and go to heaven, they are preaching another message that is not the gospel of Jesus. It, it is a powerless gospel, and just like uh, Paul warned Timothy in the in the last day, there would be perilous times, for men would be lovers of self and lovers of pleasure. And he says there in Second Timothy three verse five, he says, "There are those who are promoting a religion, but not one conforming to godliness. They they don't have power. They don't have the power of grace that comes in by the power of the Holy Spirit." to to actually reorganize the internal world of thinking. And so, you know, that's what we do here in pastoral care and counseling and sometimes labor literally for years with people. You know, some people think, you know, you can go to a few sessions of counseling. You just spent 20 years of, in homosexual perversion. And, you know, if you see a counselor three or four times a month for an hour, I'm sorry, you know, even at the best, you know, maybe 50 hours a, a, a year, and you think you're going to get 20 years of, of sexual addiction uh, fixed by, you know, 50 hours of counseling, it's unrealistic. And so it would be disingenuous of me to say, you know what, you have some suffering, you have some dying to yourself to do, you have some hard work, and that's why we offer these support groups so that you're actually putting more time in, like three and four hours a week, rather than just a you know an, an, a counseling session here or there. No wonder these people are falling away. No wonder there's a normalization taking place, even in the highest places of Christianity, because they don't understand that it takes a lot of hard work internally. And what is the thing I think is the most egregious with the scholars, Bible scholars, they should know better in the words of Jesus. Just like Paul warned, we must be preaching a gospel that is based upon the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ, conforming the soul to godliness. And the words of Jesus are very, very clear. It is a narrow way. It is a, a, a small gate. It is, uh, you know, only 25% uh, in the parable of the sower, the seed that bear fruit, the, the Jesus is saying that many, many go the broad way and few go the narrow way. And these people in the highest places of Christianity should be preaching this gospel. But see, it's not really politically correct. And it doesn't give your, you know, your big tithing uh, uh, families who, who have gay identified loved ones uh, that feeling of security when you start preaching the words of Jesus. Uh, because Jesus didn't make it so cut and dry. And that's part of the biggest problem that I see in the church are these pastors that are honestly, they're more afraid of what people think than God thinks. Uh, because they'll yell and scream at them and call them bigot and homophobe and, and you know, all kinds of nasty names. Uh, and that's what we're up against. So there is a great oppression going on in the church. Of course, the culture is going to submit to this humanistic, oppressive thing that's going on. But this is very disturbing what's going on in the church. Well, you're exactly right. And then you have best-selling books. It's been a bestseller for five years. God and the Gay Christian, 
The Biblical Case in Support of Same-Sex Relationships by Matthew Vines, which yes. has been at the top of the best-selling charts for five years, and it has become a Bible. Uh, it's, never, it's number seven in, in a category called Religious Intolerance. Uh, it's number eight in Gender and Sexuality and Religious Studies. It's number 13 in Self-Help for Catholics, and it's been a bestseller for five years because it's the get-out-of-jail-free card that he's peddling to those that know better, but they're looking for to arm themselves with the refuting of the scriptures and saying, but over here it says this, and that's supposed to counter and negate. And this is something that, that uh, we have to make ourselves aware of the same way the um, uh, documentary that you have coming out, uh, narrated by Dr. Michael Brown, the work of Dr. Michael Brown, your work there at First Stone, incredibly important work for bringing light into darkness. We are not condemning the person who is a, a practitioner of, of a homosexual lifestyle. We understand that this is not something that you uh, um, want to be condemned for. We don't want to condemn you. We're not a condemning voice. But That's right. the same way, if you were an alcoholic, we'd be reaching out a hand to your help. If you were a drug addict, we would be reaching out. If you were suffering from multiple personality disorders, we'd be offering you help for your situation. And this is a cry for help for so many, but people aren't hearing it as a cry for help. They're patting them on the back and saying, don't worry about it, it's okay. What you're doing is just fine, and it's okay in the sight of the Lord. And that is a false prophet, and that is a false word from God, and we are committed to biblical truth, not to biblical condemnation. This is not a program and not an environment we want to condemn anybody. We want to identify all the experiences. There are temptations everywhere in every aspect of our lives. Uh, you may be an adulterer. You may be uh, uh, any uh, 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 involved in pornography. You, so many different things that are whittling away at the moral fiber. And listen, this quarter three strands is wonderful, but if every day you're taking a, an X-Acto knife and shaving a little bit more off of it, eventually it's going to break. And so right. we want to dull the knife that's coming up against it to keep that sanctity intact. We're talking with Stephen Black of Freedom Realized, author of the book Freedom Realized, and executive director of First Stone Ministries. And you can find more at him, about him at firststone.org. O -R -G. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about this new documentary, which is coming out, and hopefully the, the uh, uh, movie theaters will be um, open, and uh, hundreds of them will be carrying this. It's scheduled to come to theaters in October, hoping that this COVID virus will keep it, uh, um, will allow the theaters to open, but uh, we want to talk about that. Um, and other, other points that you make in uh, many of your uh, articles, uh, your newsletter, and all the ways that you can avail yourself of the help. Uh, as you deal with someone you love, how can you help them? There are ways and tools that he provides you with how you can help them without condemning them, without shunning them, without separating them or ostracizing them. There is an inclusion, but it is an inclusion which deals with this honestly and openly and is not using a, a, a light, walking on coals when you're talking to somebody about this. Being real is a part of being a believer, and calling sin, sin, is exactly what the Bible encourages us to do. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back with Stephen Black from First Stone Ministries. Shalom. I'm Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, inviting you to join me and my special featured guests twice per month with Rabbi Zeb Parat and Carl Gallops, and monthly with Dr. Michael Heiser, Dr. Michael Lake, Dr. Timothy Jennings, Dr. Mark Baker, Dr. Jeffrey Johnson, Drs. Michelle and Mark Sherwood, Dr. Kim Moss, Derek Gilbert, Peter Rosenberger, 
Brandon Gallops, Steve Fair, Stephen Black, and Sean Tabbitt for in-depth insights into Israel, prophecy, the unseen realm, the brain, spiritual warfare, overcoming shame, mysteries of the Bible, prophetic insights, the sensational and the supernatural, caregiving, addiction recovering, understanding the divided heart, same-sex attraction, and much more. We're proud to feature some of the greatest biblical minds from both Israel and around the United States. Check out our featured guest lineup and 24-7 feed on IgnitingAnation.com or watch by topic on any device with our free apps. If you can't find what you need, you're just not looking in the right place. Follow us on social media and download our free apps today. With today's smartphone technology, news, information, sports, and entertainment is widely available and almost unbounded. But what about the information that believers in Yeshua are looking for? Well, now there's an app for that. Igniting a Nation now has apps available for Android and iPhone. With our app, you'll gain access to everything you would in our website, from our featured guests to our live streaming shows. Visit Google Play or the Apple Store and download Igniting a Nation's new app today. Shalom. I'm Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker inviting you to join me and Israel's number one rated guide, Edo Kanan, for our annual Israel trip. Our 2022 trip is now open for registration for our 18th trip to Israel. Our trip will take us from Tel Aviv to the Galilee, down to the Dead Sea, and four nights in Jerusalem. You will walk where Yeshua walked and watch the Bible turn from black and white to living color. Visit ignitinganation.com forward slash events and download the registration form today. No, it's not too early to take advantage of our payment plan designed to fit any budget. All of our trips sell out and we want you to experience this life-changing journey. Registration is now open for April 2nd to 13th, 2022. And we promise you, you will never read your Bible the same way again. Welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Stephen Black of Freedom Realized, author of Freedom Realized, and executive director of FirstStone.org, First Stone Ministries. Stephen, welcome back. Hey, thank you, sir. Uh, Stephen, uh, there is a uh, new uh, documentary coming out uh, that uh, you want to talk about uh, that's going to be opening in October. Um, give us a little bit of uh, a brief about that, where people can take a look at the trailer. Yeah, I'm very excited about this documentary. I was able to view it a few weeks ago for the first time, and then this last Saturday, morning in Tupelo, Mississippi, we were we did the first public screening of it at the In His Image Purity Conference and the documentary is In His Image Delighting in God's Plan for Gender and Sexuality and there's a stellar lineup of contributors and your listeners can go to InHisImage.movie that's a, a new website they're using is dot movie now so in his image dot movie and when you go there you can see that there is a trailer now and a sign up right now this week uh, for people that sign up they can uh, view the documentary called the sneak peek for on August 1st um, and then it will be going into the movie theaters uh, hopefully October 20th and 21st across the nation. But you got people like Ryan Anderson, who is the senior research fellow at the Heritage uh, Foundation. You got Michael Brown, who's one of my heroes in God, um, who is narrating uh, the documentary. You got uh, an awesome doctor bringing science and in chronology, uh, uh, children's pediatrics. Um, Michelle Cretella, and she knows her stuff on dealing with hormone blockers. You've got amazing theologians like Kevin DeYoung, Robert uh, Gagnon, Abraham Hamilton, who is also the policy uh, 
uh, analysis guy there with the American Family Association. This documentary is being produced by American Family Studios, which is a subsidiary of American Family Association. Then you've got amazing testimonies. My testimonies in it. Not that I'm saying mine is amazing. People like it, though. But our new staff member, Laura Beth Perry, who came out of transgenderism, uh, she has an incredible story, along with her mother, will be testifying in this. And then uh, Denise Schick, who is a good friend, dear and friend, who's been, written many books. Been on yeah, I think many, you've had her on. Many yep. times. Yep. She's terrific. She also explains her story about having a father who left the family to become a woman. Uh, just egregious, painful stuff. And then you've got really great uh, culture warriors, uh, who is a author and com uh, 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 columnist uh, himself, uh, Doctor Everett Piper. Um, he's a stellar guy. He's a good friend. Had, had him on before. He's the dean of uh, the university there. And, yes, he's uh, retired now. But yeah, yeah, he was with the Wesleyan University right. in Bartlesville. And Terrific he, man, and, ro and who ro wrote, yeah, wrote uh, an ro incredible book. Yeah, called We Are Not a Daycare. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, that's right. We, we, we had him on. He said, we don't, we, you don't come here to get a degree in your opinion. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That was yeah. my favorite line from his. From, uh, and he's just terrific. Anyhow, this documentary is a must-see, uh, especially in context of this this constant barrage from Hollywood and and this now the uh, the SPLC and the human rights campaign and these people working with them and these uh, people developing these anti-Christ, uh, anti-therapy, uh, anti-counseling documentaries uh, to try to lay waste, honestly, to teenagers, to tell teenagers don't even bother. And this documentary does the exact opposite it presents the beauty of the image of God and in science, in Bible, in testimony, and it just does an, an absolutely fantastic job. I am so excited about this documentary. It is way past its time due uh, to come out, and we are really looking forward. We are praying and hoping that it goes into movie theaters because it will give an avenue of evangelism and otherwise people that wouldn't come to a church or a ministry to watch a documentary maybe they would come to a document documentary at a movie theater and have their popcorn and coke and eat it too right and so i i'm really hoping that um first stone ministries can buy up a theater and we you know distribute tickets to uh people that we want to reach uh, with the truth. And I think that this is would be an awesome tool. Uh, and even if it's not uh, able to screen in movie theaters, we are definitely having, we have plans uh, to screen in community centers and other places and churches as well. Praise God. Praise God. It, if when you take a look over first, first stone, and I want people to understand that in all these years, um, how many people do you feel that you've been able to have a positive impact through the work of first stone? Uh, the testimonies coming out of it as to life changing, and not because they stopped being homosexuals or same sex attracted, but because they got healed because they got past the shame. They reconciled the shame, went to the core, went through the therapies, not conversion therapies, but actual psycho, uh, psychological counseling with a licensed therapist using, yes. uh, using uh, American Psychological Association uh, degreed personnel who were practicing uh, uh, this therapy of regular counseling. If I went to them for anxiety, they would use the same method to look at what my source of anxiety. Uh, everything has a root 
and they're looking to help identify and reconcile that root. So uh, to give an idea of the magnitude of First Stone and your reach, right there in Oklahoma, but yet it is right there in the center. It's like the spoke, uh, the, the center uh, and the spokes are, are branching out from the, you're the hub and branching out to the nation, uh, very strategically located. Yeah, the, the reality is uh, when the Exodus implosion was taking place, we decided uh, as one of the only ministries that had been around for, uh, you know, since 1976, so 40, uh, almost 45 years now, that we would look at our client folders that we had in storage and we digitized them, we scanned them in, we built databases, we contacted uh, 1,200 intact uh, client folders. We were able to make contact with over 500 people. Now, I had enlisted a statistician, and he told me, you know, if you get just a sampling of 50 people, you're going to know what the percentages are. And I thought, no way, I want at least a couple of hundred, right? Well, we were able to get 185 people to fill out the survey half of those people were within the first like 10 15 years and then the last were the last 10 years and the numbers from the first uh, set of years and the second set of years hardly changed at all really the only number that changed was that uh, those who had been sexually molested had actually gone down some and I think that's because of the prolific uh, uh, internet use of pornography the people don't need to be molested as children anymore they can be inundated with pornography at early ages but the bottom line numbers of that survey which no other ministry in the united states has ever conducted and it took us two years to get that thing done it was a lot of work and the bottom line was 72 percent uh that actually gave one year of discipleship care, pastoral care counseling, and support group ended up on the other side believing completely surrendered lives to Jesus Christ as Lord and did not take on an LGBTQ plus Christian label, but went on to live productive lives surrendered to Christ. So the idea that people can't change or that people don't want to change is a complete lie. People do change. And I have personally witnessed thousands of men that I have ministered to over the years in group settings, in conferences, uh, in other places throughout the world. I've been to Venezuela, Canada, Mexico, Israel. Uh, we, we have seen change all over the world and people want change. And so this is what we're about. That's what this documentary is about. And the numbers show that those who really want it actually do make change. And there was even a psychological offering by some PhDs, Dr. Santoro, who put out a report last summer, a year ago last summer. So I think it was 2018. And his report showed the same basic numbers that 70 plus percentage of people that wanted change through a religious offering, uh, they called it religious offering, uh, that received counseling also were on a trajectory of moving away, 70, more than 70% of them, of moving away from an identity of being gay. So Very the strong. idea that people don't change is is completely a fabrication and a lie. They want us to believe that so that they can, you know, honestly recruit the young people, fresh, you know, souls and lives and meat into the gay community. That's the hardcore truth about this. Amen. Amen. We've been talking with Stephen Black, Executive Director of First Stone Ministries. You can find him at firststone.org. I strongly recommend you get a copy of his book, Freedom Realized, which is his personal story of finding freedom from homosexuality and living a life free from labels. And uh, follow them. Follow firststone.org and sign up for a preview of the movie, uh, which is coming out in his image and go to inhisimage.movie 
and in 11 days, 12 hours, 2 minutes and 16 sec seconds, you can watch this preview. And uh, I strongly encourage you to do so. Stephen Black, always great to see you. We'll see you right back here uh, for your next appearance as you are here on the third Monday of every month in the 11 o'clock hour for Freedom Realized, the Freedom Realized Hour. God bless you, my friend, and we'll see you soon. Thank you so much. God bless you. We're gonna shalom. Take a, shalom. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.